If we want to put a halt to climate change, we've got to follow the money. The big high carbon companies spewing out emissions and causing all the issues, coal, oil, gas, chemicals, cement, aviation, every one of these sectors depends from day to day utterly on banking services and on insurance. And from year to year, they depend for support for their business strategies on big institutional investors that own their shares and get to vote at their annual general meetings on who sits on the boards. Those investors are our pension funds. The truth is that the high carbon industries and the high carbon companies of the world cannot move a muscle without the support of financial institutions that all of us are very familiar with. If you have a bank account, if you have any savings in a pension fund, if you have money with a fund manager, then you have a very real stake in this. And that stake gives you more power than you might have thought to help fix the climate emergency. But we do need to activate our money. Coming up for 20 years ago, I stumbled across the well-kept secret that you don't need to be wealthy to mobilise your money and use the power of finance to create positive change in the world. It started for me when I began work as a community organiser in the East End of London, and I was tasked with helping to launch and develop the Living Wage Campaign. The national minimum wage is not enough to live on, never has been, especially in London. We wanted living wages with a big shapeless problem like poverty pay or climate change. You've got to break that problem down into manageable bits. And 20 years ago for us in East London, that looked like picking off contract cleaning. All the big banks in Canary Wharf and the financial companies, but also all the hospitals in East London, all awarded big contracts for cleaning. And the people that worked on those contracts were on rock bottom wages. And my job in the first months of our campaign involved sneaking into the broom cupboards of the hospitals across East London, and then in the evening, heading down to Canary Wharf to find the hidden service entrances where I met with dozens and dozens of cleaners and listened to their stories and began to figure out how would we break down this problem and begin to make headway with this campaign. One evening I was introduced to Abdul Durant in the basement of the Canary Wharf main tower. Abdul was propped up against a ginormous bin two meters wide and two meters tall and he'd been working night shifts as a cleaner for many years. He was very much up for a chat. In fact, Abdul was very much up for some action. At that time, HSBC Bank was just completing construction of an enormous new world headquarters at Canary Wharf. And right next door, Barclays Bank, their old rival in the British banking establishment, was building another tower, approaching these banks and engaging them as targets of our campaign was an obvious next step. And so we reached out first to HSBC and asked them if they would consider writing living wage standards into the contract they were about to award for their new world headquarters. The chairman of the bank was very clear on the matter. No, he said, it's for the market to decide. We will not interfere in the matter of these wages. Well, at that time, as of today, still today, it was very easy to purchase a few shares in each of the banks with an eye to attending their annual general meetings and putting the question further um, to the whole board of, of, of both companies. Abdul had just been assigned to work on the contract at the new tower, um, HSBC's new tower. So it was obvious that he would be the right person to put the question at their AGM. And going to Barclays fell to me. This was a very daunting proposition. The annual general meetings of large banks are huge affairs with hundreds of shareholders. And the boards sit up on a big stage and glare down at all the shareholders beneath. You do not want to fluff up your question. 
But to their credit, the directors of Barclays were actually quite gracious when I suggested that they consider writing living wage standards and ensuring that everyone working in their new headquarters would be paid the living wage. They didn't dismiss it out of hand as HSBC had done, but agreed to take it away, consider it and talk it over with us. Three weeks later, at HSBC's AGM, Abdul Durant caused a huge stir with his question. For a start, it was absolutely unheard of for a cleaner not just to be seen, but to be heard at the annual general meeting of one of Britain's biggest companies. And he asked and made a request, made the case for living wages with such quiet dignity. The following day, the story was all over the business pages of the British press. We had put the issue on the map. Some eight months or so later, no doubt with an eye to stealing a march on their big rival in banking, Barclays announced that they would be the first big company in this country to write living wage standards into their service contracts. A huge win for our campaign. It was very widely publicised and not long later, HSBC decided to follow suit. For all that bluff about the market must decide, it turned out that the directors of HSBC could very much make their own decision to do the right thing. What that experience proved to me was the extraordinary potential and power of mobilising our money to create positive change in the world. And 20 years on, I still own the shares that I bought in those companies to help support the living wage campaign. And lately, those shares have been coming in very handy all over again. In fact, my five shares in HSBC have been a very sound investment. The banks of the world are utterly critical to the climate outcomes we now need. Banks must stop financing the fossil fuel industries, particularly for expansion of new coal, oil and gas. And at the same time, banks must make conditional the financing and loans they provide to, come to sectors like chemicals and cement and, and, and steel, that as a condition of finance, those, those companies in those sectors must produce detailed and rigorous plans showing how they will bring down their emissions year on year. As we know, we're in a catastrophic climate situation if we don't shrink emissions globally by about 7% a year for the whole of this decade. It's an unbelievably daunting prospect, but it's what the science demands and banks have an utterly central role to play in making it happen. Earlier this year, the organisation I now work for, Share Action, pulled together a coalition of 130 shareholders in HSBC to put a bold proposition to the banks. We coordinated the filing of a shareholder resolution, which called on HSBC to cease financing the global coal sector. To file a shareholder resolution in the UK, you need to have a minimum of 100 shareholders involved. Most of the shareholders in our coalition owned just a single share in HSBC. A single share in HSBC costs four pounds and 15 pence. <laughs> Most people had come together, they'd gone out to buy a share so that they could help us get over that critical threshold of 100 shareholders. But in our coalition included were some of the biggest pension funds in the UK and Europe's largest fund managers. Over the years, as we've grown and developed this movement, we've got more and more real power on board. So how did HSBC respond? Well, they have committed to phase out all financing of the global coal sector in the rich countries of the world by 2030 and in the rest of the world by 2040. Is it enough? Is it everything we want? No, not yet, but it is a fantastic start. It's a big step up for HSBC and it's testimony to the power of this form of action. So what would accelerate the change we need? How do we ensure that the global finance industry takes climate change seriously? Well, for one thing, if you haven't already, it's time to let the companies looking after your money know that this matters to you. Get on the phone or send an email to your bank and make sure you know how they compare with the other banks 
when it comes to the financing of high carbon industry. Share Action can help you with that. Band together with other people in your place of work who share the same outlook as you do on climate change. You'll be in the same workplace pension scheme and together you're much stronger in making the case to the people that look after your money on your behalf that they should put climate considerations front and centre. What Abdul showed with his question all those years ago was the startling effect of finding your voice and expressing your values in the corridors of financial power. You can do it too. In fact, we need your support. It's time to activate your money.